am I? Good morning. I'm Judith Lay, welcoming you to Praise, the program that connects faith and daily life. Man's Radio. And on today's program, celebrating a special anniversary gives us the chance to learn more about a charity that's providing a unique service to some of the world's most vulnerable people. I'm talking about Mission Aviation Fellowship that believes every community, no matter how remote, should have the essentials of life. And they use their fleet of light aircraft to make that happen. We're not only going to hear from their chief executive officer and from one of their pilots, but also from local teenager Grace Harrison, who's about to be assessed to see if she's got what it takes to join the team who are quite literally flying for life. And I'll be talking to some members of the gospel choir that's got everyone talking. They're the eager gospel choir from Leicester, on the island to take part in the Festival of Choirs in the Villa Marina this weekend. They started singing on the Ben McCree on Friday night, and they've not stopped since. We've all fallen in love with them, and you can meet them later in the programme. But let's start with a different style of music. Mission Aviation Fellowship offers help to anyone of any faith or no faith, but the charity itself is deeply Christian and all that the teams do is firmly and clearly rooted in Christ alone. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my soul This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving cease My comforter, my all and all Here in the love of Christ I stand Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live Stuart Townend's worship song, In Christ Alone. That recording by Keith and Kristen Getty with Alison Krauss. Ten years ago, Ramsey-based business AFD Software, a company well known for its constant generosity to many charities, made headline news when directors David and Alison Doricott donated a Kodiak light aircraft to the charity Mission Aviation Fellowship. Costing over $2 million, the gift of the plane was to celebrate AFD's 25th year in business. On the 10th anniversary of the plane starting its vital work in Kalimantan on the island of Borneo, a team from Mission Aviation Fellowship have returned to the island to report on what the plane has achieved and how the charity's fleet of light aircraft are changing literally millions of lives every year. They brought flight simulators and organised challenges so that we could try to plan relief operations, loading freight and passengers and trying to land our plane on a tiny runway surrounded by mountains, rivers and forests, just like the MAF teams do every day of the year. And I had the chance to talk with MAF's Chief Executive Officer in the UK, Ruth Whitaker, and Steve Machel, who, in addition to being an experienced pilot, is also a country director for Chad in Africa. I began by asking Ruth to tell us exactly what Mission Aviation Fellowship does. MAF is a Christian charity flying light aircraft in developing countries and our role is to enable access really. So there are very many people living uh, cut off really from the necessities of life, cut off because of geographical obstacles, mountains, jungles, desert, swamp and we want to help people 
get their everyday needs. So we fly the light aircraft. It means that we land on grass airstrips, rough runways, sometimes sides of mountains. We enable other organisations to reach those people in need and to take help to take practical things, to take church workers, to take health care, all the things that we take for granted so often in this country. And in times of real crisis and um, disaster relief to enable quick access to those remote and isolated places. I had the privilege of watching your presentation and I was staggered by the number of big charities. You just enable them to function. We fly a lot of household names, but we also fly small organisations that work in country that have specialist knowledge of language and culture and all of them need to reach these places to reach people in need. We say that we fly not as a luxury but as a lifeline. Now I'm delighted also to bring into the conversation one of your pilots, Steve Machel, and tell me where do you operate? I have been operating uh, most recently in Kenya um, in East Africa and have recently transitioned to Chad, MAF in Chad, in the central part of Africa, right in the middle. In your presentation, you were talking about work in an area torn apart by civil war. We're talking about South Sudan, so one of the world's newest countries uh, that gained independence in 2011, but since then has been in racked by civil war between, between warring people groups. And MAF had been serving there for many, many years, and I was involved in the work there from Kenya, which is one of the support bases that we use to, to support our program directly in Juba, in, in South Sudan. And um, yes, it, the infrastructure in the country was poor to start with, and it's worse now. Uh, and in many uh, locations, there just isn't a safety on the roads, if you can call them roads, because often they're just, you know, dirt and murram uh, in the rainy season they become quagmires and pretty much impassable so many of the places that that people are, find themselves in in south sudan that are isolated of course they then don't have access to health care education mainly as a result of the war which is just devastated and, and and lots of the infrastructure and the development work that had happened over many years m much of that was destroyed almost overnight the aid that you provide is, is, is so varied, as, as Ruth was saying. Yes, that's right. On any given day, say one of our Cessna caravan aircraft that operates up in South Sudan, so it has a one-tonne capability of lifting freight or 10, 10 to 12 passengers. And on any given day, you might find that there's a water and sanitation engineer on board. There might be a Bible translator or a pastor. There might be some educational specialists, some medical personnel. And then underneath in the pod where we carry our freight, there might be some vaccines that are kept in a cool box to keep them nice and cool. There might be some food. We have a, a thing which we call Plumpy Nut, um, which one of our big organisations we fly uses it as an emergency food stuff that can be used to reach people who are in chronic food insecurity and famine situations. And then at the same time, we might have other education materials and Bibles and basically if you name it and if isolated people might need, have a need for it in terms of their physical sustenance and their spiritual sustenance, then we're probably going to be flying it. Now, spiritual sustenance, your faith, God is at the centre of everything that you do. That's absolutely right, yes. The genesis of MAF was through a desire to see aircraft used for blessing and for, from godly men and women who had that vision. And I think that vision carries on till today. So we fly people of all faiths and none, and we fly into areas where people may have a variety of different worldviews and faiths, but we do what we do in the name of Jesus Christ, and we want to make sure that as we work out our faith, we're able to be um, like the Samaritan's donkey in a way, providing the delivery means for organisations to reach and to serve isolated people. Next year, 2020, will be 75 years since the birth of the vision of MAF. And as Steve says, started by some Christian airmen after the Second World War that saw aircraft used for destruction and believed that it could be used for positive purposes, as it were. So I think there's a, there's a verse that, uh, for me, is uh, very important in 1 John 3 that says, let us love not only in word but in deed and in truth and uh, you know we're very much a, a practical bunch we're a technical mission we and um, we want to show the love of God in practical ways and so that's very much at the heart of who we are and what we do it's about working that faith out in action and making a way using our professional skills our technical skills 
to serve people and to, to do that, as I say, in, in very practical ways. I'd love to talk a little bit about Kalimantan because that's obviously the, the reason we're here as a team this weekend and, and it's a really thrilling to be here and to, to celebrate 10 years uh, since that wonderful gift, as you say. Kalimantan is a, a, a country of mountains, of dense forestation, steep mountains and so traveling around is really quite difficult and you know we don't always think about that uh, from our experiences but you could have a couple of villages that are sort of as the crow flies really only a few kilometers away but actually could be two days walk because of that that terrain and the lack of roads and so an aircraft like uh, the Kodiak which is able to take eight people ten people to land on very short runways to be able to operate in those that mountainous region it can often do those those trips in in minutes in comparison and so as we say can help bring food and to um, bring medicines but also yes to bring bible translators pastors and to help there and in other countries where we we serve particularly in Africa actually the legs tend to be longer a longer flight leg but uh, it means that when we take people uh, if they're going to go and serve and if they're doctors or medical professionals it means they arrive actually fresh rather than being exhausted from a couple of days of arduous travel they're ready to to work straight away there's a story uh, we often hear about um, eye surgeons you know in this country people tend to associate cataracts with something that you you have as a challenge later in life but there are many people across the developing world for example who suffer with cataracts in their 30s and if you take an eye surgeon and his team he sets up a field hospital actually I call it a tent, we can get them there in short time, they're able to immediately start working, assessing people, helping people. It's really life transforming for people to receive their sight back in their 30s and when, and when there's people who've never seen their own children or not seen them grow up, it, it's uh, wonderful to hear. We would think as something that's relatively simple, transforming lives in that way. We want to, to say every life matters. And uh, sometimes when we read some of the, the statistics almost of the, of the impact of civil war or the difficulties in some of these nations, it can, these statistics can become slightly meaningless or academic, but actually at the end of that, every one of those numbers is a real person. And so, yes, where we can do medical evacuations, we can change lives, we can help people, they can get quick response. I mean, again, stories that we sometimes tragically hear of children that have fallen into fires, uh, common to have open fires, and getting burn treatment, it needs to be quick. So yes, the, if we can connect people, we can get people to medical services, the impact is enormous and that life is literally transformed. Steve, you've brought with you a couple of flight simulators. Also, a challenge that groups of people have been queuing up to try the challenge. But the challenge, whilst it's a very interesting game for us, is real everyday life for you, looking at the cargo and what you've got to do, working out how you're going to do it. You're doing that all the time, aren't you? That's right. As an MAF pilot, we actually wear, I think, well over a dozen hats I counted up once. So we become the baggage handler, the check-in clerk. We perform our pre-flight checks on the aircraft. And and although in the big cities where we sometimes start from, um, we have a support team you know, of some of our other staff. But once we then fly out to the remote locations, we do everything. And there's often no air traffic control or you know, local entity on the strip. And so it's not quite as easy as uh, just calling up uh, on the radio. One has to make a first pass normally. And we check to see that there are no animals on the runway and that there aren't any children playing, that sort of thing. So we do a low pass and we make sure that you know the rains haven't washed away the edge of the runway and things like that and we come around and do a and, and do our landing always being vigilant to things that might happen so I've had zebra come running across in front of my plane before I've had um, little children who you know are not so familiar with aircraft getting dangerously close as we're getting ready to depart one has to sort of bear all these things in mind it's bush flying you know in a fairly essential form it's not for the faint-hearted we've had pilots who've joined us from the airlines and from the Royal Air Force and other other military backgrounds and I think for many people it's a big challenge to make that jump but it's very rewarding 
How did you get involved, Steve? I learned to fly when I was 17. I received a flying scholarship from the Royal Air Force, and so I got my pilot's licence um, before I could drive, actually, just after my 17th birthday. And that same year, um, I also became a Christian. So I was invited to go on a, on a Christian camp after I'd failed my O-level RE exam. And a very enterprising young evangelist friend of mine at school invited me to go on the camp because he said I'd learn enough to pass my reset. And that's indeed what happened. But beyond that, I also decided discovered that Jesus could be a friend and so I invited him into my life at that point. I'd grown up in a church context and I think I'd always understood much of the Christian faith but not appropriated it personally for myself. And so those two things happened at the same time and I wanted to pursue an, a career in aviation um, but the doors didn't open for me at the time. I went to university and, and then sort of had a meandering route into a couple of other careers but I had done a gap year in Africa and the, the thought of working overseas and then with my faith as well, working overseas as a missionary grew stronger and stronger. And after I met the lady who's now my wife, Katie, who'd also had a similar experience uh, through a gap year, she and I decided that we would take a career break. So just after our son, Jack, was born in 1999, we took a career break. We went to Bible college for two years. And um, 20 years later, we're still on that career break. Um, we worked for another mission first and was gradually coming back into aviation because I was working in a ground-based role but in a mission aviation setting. And a colleague challenged me one day and he said, we are short of pilots and you've got your pilot's license and I know you dearly love to fly. And he said, so why don't you consider it? And then a very good friend of mine from our home church who was uh, leading a retreat in, uh, out in, in, in Africa where I was working, he said to me, well, if you could wave your magic wand and there was no obstacle in the way for you pursuing your dream within God's economy, what would it be? And I said, well, I've, I think I've always felt that I'd love to fly planes for God. And he said, well, why aren't you doing it? And suddenly, I, it was almost as if not exactly the scales fell from my eyes, but I suddenly couldn't think of a reason why that wasn't worth pursuing. So we talked about it with our home church and we prayed about it um, with several of our close friends. And they said, yes, go for it. And so I came back to the UK. Within two years, I had my commercial pilot's license. And then I built a little bit of experience in order to meet the minimum requirements for MAF. And we applied, and we were accepted. And then I went and did my flight training with MAF, which is quite arduous. It's a lot of mountain flying and bad weather flying and learning to land on sort of postage stamps, you know, uh, as Ruth said, on the side of mountains and in some rather, you know, rough locations. And then in uh, 2012, we headed out to Kenya, um, where I joined the team there with MAF. In a moment, we're going to hear from 16-year-old Grace, who is just about to go to Amsterdam to be assessed. And, and she says herself, she always felt in her heart that she wanted to do missionary work from when she was quite young. We'll hear her saying that for herself. And obviously, being a pilot is her dream. But actually, there are loads of other things that MAF needs as well as pilots, aren't there? That's exactly right. I mean, we are a whole team uh, and we have needs for particularly engineers at the moment and managers and people with various skills in HR and accounting, uh, IT, obviously uh, broadly in aviation, in management. Um, but the whole team needs to work together. I often tell my, my team back in, in Chad and in Kenya that, that all of us is involved in reaching and serving isolated people, everyone from the cleaning staff and the hangar floor to the lovely lady who used to make my tea every day for me in Kenya, uh, and, and everybody, because without that whole team, and indeed supporters here on the island, and people supporting us in prayer and financially, our aircraft can't take off. The pilots are just the ones who fortunately get to see the very front end, the tip of, of, of the work that we do, but actually it's the whole picture. The question came up uh, amongst a group of us who were talking to you, Steve, about funding. And you were explaining that obviously for the big charities with whom you work, they help with the cost of the flights as much as they are able to. But you also made a very interesting point about you will even take the bus fare from when people offer it. Because it's all about dignity, isn't it? The people that you're helping would love to be in a position to help other people. They don't want to stand there and say, I can't 
do this. It's so it's involving them in a meaningful way, even if it is just a few pence. That's important, isn't it? I think so. One of the hot topics in, in development work in the developing world is this idea of entitlement and dependency. And, um, and so, you know, many organisations are, are really trying to think hard about how they can help individuals and communities to thrive and to be able to stand on their own two feet. And obviously they need assistance, they need financial help and they need resources to do that. But I think over the last maybe 10 or 15 years, people have seen that sometimes if that's not done carefully and if it's not done well, then it creates a sense of dependency and then that's not a healthy scenario which can endure for the long term. So, for example, we have a lovely young boy that uh, I had the privilege of flying many times in Kenya, born with club feet and through the generous donations of a hospital in near the capital, Nairobi, he was able to have operations, a number of operations, to correct his condition. And uh, we used to fly him and his mum down from the north on a regular basis. If we had an air miles system, he'd be one of our frequent flyers and you know through the partnership with the hospital and with with our flight service we were able to give him the opportunity to fly down in a much more comfortable than you know the two-day trip by road and particularly when his legs were in casts and when he couldn't walk properly that was quite arduous and quite difficult through the help of the village they were able to raise the same amount of money that it would cost them to take him by bus and so we were able to charge him the bus fare and so for him and his mum they felt that they were paying for the math flight just like anyone paying to fly over you know to the other side of the Atlantic on EasyJet but at the same time of course we were able to make sure that that they could afford it and that would happen. It's an international organisation, it's a charity, it's expensive. We've just talked about, about providing planes and all the personnel that's involved. But of course it's regular and, and detailed and very specific maintenance for the planes. So you're looking to encourage supporters and to sustain that. And I was looking around at some of the things that you offer to interest people in your work. I'm particularly impressed with the Discovery Air Pass. Well, as Steve says, our supporters are absolutely vital. They're a key part of the team and we really, really couldn't do it without them. We're so blessed to have faithful supporters but uh, to be honest we're always looking for new people to join the team and so we're thrilled when we can inspire people and engage people in an informative way. So yes we do have um, something we call the Discovery Air Pass so we say come come round the world with us for a year and we'll take you to some of the destinations that MAF fly to and operate in and places uh, and the people we serve. So we uh, offer this where we'll tell you, we'll take you to a number of countries, we'll tell you about the culture, we might even tell you about some of the food, the language, the people that we serve, the needs there and why MAF are there. And so you get a taste of a number of different countries and then at the end of that we say, would you like to come on board in the longer term? We promise not to bombard you with uh, lots of... Um, communications but we want them to be inspiring communications so that people are interested because it's such a, a different world out there outside of probably the culture that many of us interact with and so we hope that they will catch the vision too and join the team. Ruth it's 10 years since last we met and talked so you must enjoy what you do. How did you get involved? I do love what I do it's a great privilege actually. Um, I got involved uh, probably because of my mother. <laughs> when I was uh, quite small, I was always fascinated uh, by aircraft, and my father and I used to go off to, to air shows, really, and even when I was eight, um, left my sisters at home with my mother. And I became interested in engineering. I was good at physics and maths, loved it, so studied aeronautical engineering, and my mother heard of MAF, and... Uh, she was a praying woman, and I think she thought, right, we're, we're just going to mention. So she used to very casually leave the prayer diary and the magazine around at home. So I spent some sort of teenage, late teenage years, probably thinking that everybody knew about MAF because we did. And uh, as the years went on, that, that seed got planted at the back of my mind, especially when I was at university, that one day I would work for MAF. Uh, I did actually work initially in the um, aircraft manufacturing industry and spent some years sort of learning all sorts of other things, project management and, and man management as it were. But for many years I thought one day I will work for MAF. 
uh, the doors opened. It took me a while to get here, really, and uh, it has. It is a privilege, and it has been a privilege, and I think it's a just a wonderful reminder of what we can take for granted in our lives, uh, and also what a, a wonderful reminder of what God can do. Well, the whole team, you are wonderful ambassadors for the charity. It's been such a privilege to meet you again. Wonderful to have that little extra window into the work of math. Flying for life, thank you very much indeed for talking to me. Thank, thank you. you. Before you I kneel, my master and maker To offer the work of my hands For this is the day You've given your servant I will rejoice and be glad For the strength I have to live and breathe For each skill your grace has given me For the needs and opportunities That will glorify your great name anniversary celebrations of AFD Software's gift of a light aircraft to Mission Aviation Fellowship were appropriately held at AFD Software's headquarters at Mountain View Innovation Centre in Ramsey, where crowds of people came to watch films of pilots at work, listen to talks and of course try the challenge of flying a plane for ourselves. Among them, I found 16-year-old Grace Harrison, who just happened to mention that she's about to go to a very special MAF branch in Amsterdam. So, of course, I just had to find out why. Do some tests with Mission Aviation Fellowship to see if I would be a suitable pilot for them. Is this something that you've always wanted to do? Since I was really young, I've seen, like, third world countries on the news and I've always wondered how I could help and and I feel like God's called me to do that my whole life and it was my parents that suggested that I could be a pilot with MAF and I was really excited about that so when we were on holiday we went to visit them and they suggested I did a suitability test before I started learning and training with them. Have you any idea what the tests will involve Grace? I've been told that I will be taken flying and then I will be tested on how I learn so I'll do the flying again two days later I think and then see how I've learned and see which ways I learn and see if that's the right way. I'm going to do an IQ and personality test. How long will it last? I'll be there for three days and I'll have a test each day. Will you know at the end of it whether you can go further or or will you have to wait? I think I'll have to wait a little bit to get the results but because of my age I'm only 16 they'll have leeway because I still haven't got my full developed personality and IQ yet, so hopefully. But if you did well, they would say, we'll keep watching you and we'll watch your development and you'd presumably go back and, and have more experiences with them? Yeah, hopefully if it goes well, then I will be able to train as a pilot with them and they've got three sections of tests to do and then do Bible school. And either way, I'd like to be a missionary with them because <laughs> that's what I've always just wanted to do. Well, it seems to me from having spent time with them all that there's loads of opportunities, there's loads of really important things that that you can do. Interesting that you mentioned Bible study because all the staff have made it really clear that prayer is crucial to everything that they do. Everything is rooted in prayer. Is that important to you, Grace? Almost definitely, yeah. I love the idea of prayer and that's been like a massive part of my faith. I got baptised just over a month ago and it's just been like a massive part of my life, just talking to God. Grace, I'm making a deal with you. 
Now I've met you. Now I know what you're doing. You've got to come back and give me regular reports. Is that a deal? <laughs> yeah, it's a deal. Thank you to Ruth Whitaker, Chief Executive Officer of Mission Aviation Fellowship in the UK, and Steve Machel, a pilot who is also a country director in Chad in Africa. And prayers, please, for local 16-year-old Grace Harrison as she goes to be assessed for her suitability to train as a Mission Aviation Fellowship pilot. That's a story we'll certainly be coming back to in a future programme. That's the sound of the eager gospel choir singing just for the pure joy of it as they sailed over on the Ben McCree on Friday night to take part in the Festival of Choirs at the Villa Marina this weekend. They're a church-based true community choir with a place for everyone and there was even sign language interpretation for some of their music. The choir has come with their bishop and their pastor. Let's meet them now. I'm Bishop Mark Anthony Anderson from the Midlands in England, city we call Leicester. So we are just over here on this beautiful island singing some gospel music. Your, your name is? Pastor Samuel. Are you the musical director? No, I'm not the musical director. The musical director is Jordan. I'm one of them. I just direct a few of the songs. Well, yes. this is what I love about them. Yeah. Everybody moves around. <laughs> and this lovely lady, you, your name is? Ella. And you were signing one of the songs? I did, yes. So is this really a community effort? Is it everybody pulling together? Yes, it is um, a community choir and we were inclusive of different communities, differing abilities, so that's why we you saw a bit of sign language. So you're based in a church, tell me about your church. Yes, our church is called Emmanuel Apostolic Church and it's uh, in Leicester. We just acquired an old working men's club, turning it into a community centre and a church and we welcome people from all walks of life. It's a vibrant church. I'm sure it is. If you're singing like this all the time, they must be coming from miles around. We have people come from Scotland just to hear the choir. I can be believe that. And your name is? Jordan Anderson, choir director, pianoist as well. How do you choose the material? Because a community choir, it's everybody involved. Does that determine how you choose your material? Absolutely. I mean, it's all about empowering people, encouraging one another. It's based on our walks of life and how we struggled and how, you know, we got from one place to another. We got the impact it, these songs gave to us. So we said, you know what, why not we spread it to the community and give the same impact? There is something very, very special about the power of music, isn't it? The power to you Unites the power to heal, the power to lift spirits. Mm -hmm. So that's a great starting point if you're wanting to minister, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's why we do what we do. We, we've seen the change, we've seen the unity, that harmony brings. If the whole world was singing, it would be a better place. Are you meeting a lot of need in your community? Well, in the community in Leicester, I think a lot of people now, they're spending more time on their mobile phones and on the computers, and no one is really talking to each other. But what a choir does is brings people together. We don't have to look at a screen. We can look at each other, communicate, and some of our songs are call and response. And we love, because it's a competition, we couldn't involve the, the audience as much as possible, but we love to involve the audience so that we can talk. We are human beings. We need to go back into talking. Then the world will be a better place. I believe that if you can change somebody's mind, you will change the direction. It's about changing the heart. And this is the motto of the choir, changing people's heart. Just a few members of the eager gospel choir from Leicester chatting with me after winning the Open Voice Choir class with an impressive 93 marks. They'll be singing again in the grand final, competing against the Haydock Male Voice Choir from Lancashire, the Rodillion Singers from Wakefield and the Valley Aloud Choir from Rossendale. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word take your truth planted deep in us shape and fashion us in your likeness that the light of christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak. 
speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Thank you for listening to this week's Praise Podcast. There's a new Praise Podcast available every Sunday morning. You can subscribe for free at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify via the Manx Radio smartphone app or at manxradio.com. The Praise blog is where you'll find our full church notice board alongside details of everything that we've talked about on today's programme. Again, go to manxradio.com, on the homepage, click on air and on the drop-down menu, follow the link for blogs. So, till we meet again, this is Judith saying thank you for your company and I wish you and those you love Every blessing in the days ahead. Music